Hello, everyone, and happy Tuesday. So for today's episode, I have bringing back Doug Glackey from the For Checking TV to talk all things Pittsburgh Penguins. The updates on Chris Tang and Evgeny Malkin from Pierre Lebrun. Um, we're also going to get into what he would do for free agency and potentially look at some trades. And we're going to do a cool little segment about, you know, just because there was an article in The Athletic today about the broadcasting team's that were ranked by the fans and the penguins one was in the bottom third of the league with steve mears and bob airy i'm going to get into what doug's dream broadcast for at t sports net would be um and then I'll, we'll get into what my dream one would be as well and build a segment around that so that's all coming up right after this drop your locked on penguins your daily podcast on the pittsburgh penguins part of the locked on podcast network your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. You want to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can also follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins. Uh, joining me now is Doug Glackey of the Four Trekking TV. Um, I can pretty much see him there. Uh, some of his face is covered by uh, the lighting stuff, but you know what? It's it, uh, it's it looks just fine, uh, Doug. But I haven't brought you on in probably a couple months now. It, it has to be. But you know, you, you guys do great work over there with your show. I'm very I bring you on for some Penguins talk. So um, first off, um, how you been, man? I've been doing good, man. Thanks for having me. I've just been working like crazy. You know, like just working nonstop, like 70, 80 hour work weeks. And it's been pretty much that, you know, it makes recording stuff more difficult. And I'm just glad that I'm able to come on here and talk some hockey with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that, you know, we're able to schedule this. I think we've been going back and forth like, okay, what, what, when's the best time uh, for you to come on? But, you know, thankfully um, it is tonight. I do have the Rangers bolts game on here in the background. It's still one, nothing Tampa um, as of this According, but Doug, you know, there were some updates from Pierre Lebrun on of getting Malkin and Chris Latang today. I'll read the first one um, about Malkin. Um, Pierre says there's been ongoing dialogue between the Penguins and Malkin camp since the season ended. But my sense is that the negotiation is still waiting its breakthrough moment. Malkin's camp has presented a few concepts to the Penguins, but so far nothing is moving the needle. I think this gets done eventually, but Ron Hextall is quite the puzzle to piece together with all of his pending free agents and a tight cap situation. I do think Malkin would give in a bit on term as long as the dollars were right. So we'll start with that, Doug. That screams like to me that – the Penguins, they probably have the term down, and I think Elliot Friedman touched on this a couple of weeks ago where I think they want a three- to four-year term for him, but it sounds like the money is the big holdup. I personally don't think the Penguins want to give him you know, 7.25, 7.5 for three to four years because of his injury history um, and his, I guess, decline in play, even though he was a point-per-game player this year. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Pierre LeBron report. You know, do do you foresee this having a breakthrough moment at some point, or you know, do you see this really going down to the wire here? I mean, I think it's going to have a breakthrough moment, but um, I do understand the whole like not wanting to give him seven to seven and a half million concept. I completely understand that. I know Malkin's a great player and is still producing at this point, but um, you know, I mean. I think the magic number is probably around like six and a half, six point seven five ish, and hopefully, you know, both sides are able to um, come to terms with, so- with something. Because I mean, the Pittsburgh Penguins are not the Pittsburgh Penguins without Evgeny Malkin. I mean, it's either you know, and I know that they still have to sign Latang, but if, in my opinion, it's either you bring both back or you don't bring either of them back um, at this point because like you, they're both such important players and. Um, they're, they both play very important roles on two completely different sides of the puck and you need them both. If you're going to be contending for Stanley cups going into the later years of Sid's career, where he's still one of the best players in the world. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And, you know, I, I understand I've had people come into my mentions before about the beginning Malkin and say, you know, he, he's a power play specialist at, at this point. He's been declining. And honestly, you know, I'm pretty sure out of all the centers this year, he was, I think, top 20 um, in 5v5 points per hour. 
Um, you know, again, was over a point per game, was on a 40 goal, 84 point pace for the regular season. Does he hit it if it, if he plays all 82 games? Probably not, but that was the the pace um, <clears throat> that he was on, and he still had six points in seven games. You know, it, it's funny, Doug. Vince Trocheck, who, you know, I think is a good player. It would be a storybook ending for him to, to play here just because he's from here. His whole family is from Pittsburgh. But, you know, he also only had two points um, in that uh, second round series against the New York Rangers, and he was well under a point per game during the regular season. So I I, I personally think that would be a step down um, if Malkin does walk. And, again, like who are you I, – I always like try to ask this to these people – who are you replacing him with if he walks? And I'm not asking for like silly season stuff that's not going to happen or you know, people saying Jeff Carter or anything like that. Who, who do you realistically think can take the minutes that he plays at 5v5 and the minutes that he plays on the power play and can be equal to that or better than that? And I don't think that player right now, at least on the free agent market, is out there. Now, maybe if someone is available for trade, you think about that, but – I don't think teams are willing to give away what Evgeny Malkin is, a bona fide top line center at this point. The only way they truly replace Evgeny Malkin at this point is if they give Nazem Kadri like $10 million. <laughs> and at this at this point in the game, like if you're not willing to give Evgeny Malkin $7 million for three years, you're not going to give um, Nazem Kadri a max term contract where he's making like nine or $10 million. Um, You know? And I've seen people throw around the idea of like one of the Strom brothers coming over, but like there's there's no way there's no way that either of them are replacing Malkin's production both on the power play and at five v five in my opinion. People, yeah, Ryan Strom is, is an interesting. I mean, he's not going to be re-signed by the Rangers. They have some salary cap issues of their own, I think, coming up, if I'm not mistaken. But you know, Strom, you know, fine player, but you know, he's also missed. He misses the, the net on a lot of grade a chances and if that happens in pittsburgh um uh people will be coming for his head to say the least i mean it is a stark drop off from Sidney crosby from to Kenny malkin uh and then ryan strome who would be replacing him um, i have not really seen this stuff about um his brother dylan but um i do know chicago is open to listening to basically all their players outside of seth jones uh patrick kane and jonathan taves so theoretically you could go get him but again doug the penguins don't really have you know, a lot of assets that are tradable, I think, at this point. I mean, well, players on their roster are, but, you know, I don't think Hextall wants to give away their first-round pick. Prospects, they don't really have too much down there in Wilkes-Barre. I mean, maybe Chicago could be had in a trade, but, you know, <clears throat> they got a lot back for Brandon Hagel. I thought they did a good job, even though Tampa Bay really shouldn't care about the picks they gave up. I mean, they're on, they're trying to three-peat here. But um, it's just it, – it's, it's way too hard – I mean, so, someone is going to have to bend here a little bit, or, or both sides will. You know, if sure, if the Penguins can get the term that they want, you know, and Geno's camp gets the number they want, which is maybe 6.8 to 7, you know, I, I think that's fine. You know, I remember, um, <clears throat> I think Freeman even said on his 32 Thoughts show that for the Brian Rust contract, which I was pretty stunned that they signed him, of course, um, both sides had to bend a little bit to get to where they wanted to go. And I feel like that has to happen with this one. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's it's arguable that it's going to have to happen with both him and Latang. Um, yeah. You know, because here's the thing, like their cap situation is so delicate, as is their whole trade asset situation. You know, everybody says that they can move money out and stuff like that. But like, can they really move money out, you know? Like everybody's saying, when when they say move money, everybody immediately thinks, oh, they should probably trade Brian Dumoulin. But how are you going to trade Brian Dumoulin after he just tore his, uh, one of the ligaments in his knee? And you don't know what the recovery time is going to be on that. Um, you know, I mean, they're not going to be able to move some of these guys. You know, everybody's, I mean, people have said about Brock McGinn, which I understand to an extent, but at the same time, it's like, Who's going to want to commit almost $3 million to a fourth liner who is pretty much a penalty kill specialist at this point in his career? Um, you know, and like that's the thing. Like, unfortunately, you have to pay the Piper at some point, but also still get creative, keep the window open. But they've done so much little tinkering over the past five to six years 
where they're really, really in a bind here, man. And they need to, and it's going to be hard for them to get out of it. You know, I mean, if you would have told me five or six years ago that the price to pay for winning those back-to-back cups would be us sitting here today having this conversation of are they able able to retain both uh, Evgeny Malkin and Chris Letang? I would would have told you you were insane. But as time continues to move on here, it feels like we really made a deal with the devil to win that cup in 17 because they had no business getting there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, you know, three Stanley Cups since 2009 is, you know, you're, you're one of the best dynasties in NHL history, um, I think, at this point. And yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it is nuts that we are having this discussion because, I mean, I figured they would both be signed by now. And, you know, get, getting to Crystal Tang here before we hit the commercial break, um, Dan LeBron said there have been ongoing talks between Penguins and Montana's camp. Over, since the season ended, which is encouraging in one sense, as far as Latang might be able to stay in Pittsburgh, um, he said this is a, actually a tough one to predict given Pittsburgh's cap situation and other factors up in the air. He said that Latang negotiations have been going on for about a year. They've always been largely about term. Hex, that's because Hexall wants to be careful about the number of years for a 35 year old player. Um, he says this one of those negotiations when you can easily defend each position, and it's positive that both sides continue to talk. Um, I'm of the opinion, Doug, that he should be their top priority right now. After, I mean, he should have been when they got the before the Brian Rust one was done. They got that one uh, obviously taken care of before everyone else. Now they can switch their years to this one. Um, and you said it best as well. You know, this is I think going to be one where you know one both sides are going to have to to bend a little bit. Um, in a perfect world, you may be simultaneously to a four times eight, five, five times eight, something like that. If you have to go a little bit above eight. Um, I say you do it. If, if, if say his camp wants 8.1 to 8.2, I think you bend to do it, especially if you can get a four year term. Um, he is way harder to replace. Obviously, I've been talking about that for weeks on the show. Um, John Klingberg ain't, ain't going to walk through that door and get, you know, play the minutes that Latang does and be equally good or even better. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know I touched on Eric, Eric Carlson as a trade option. But that's only really if you can get him for 50% retained. Otherwise, I'm not really interested in that. Brent Burns the same. Um, but what are your thoughts after hearing that update from um, LeBron on the Tang? And, you know, are, are you confident that he's coming back or do you still see it as a coin flip? Well, I think it's going to be closer. Th- I think it's going to be more likely that he would come back more than Malkin at this point. Um, you know, and the thing is, is like with Latang, I think we all know that at least members of this fan base should know that if Chris Letang is not on this team next year, they're probably going to be horrible. Um, I wouldn't like say entire, horrible, but they're not going to be as good. No, but they're going to be, they're going to be exceptionally mediocre and they're not <laughs> going to be the same penguins that we all see and that, that we've all known to love and uh, cheer for all these years. And um, I mean, really there's, there's no way to replace them. Um, John Klingberg is nowhere on, you know, you're not going to, you're not, you don't have the assets to trade for Eric Carlson at 50% most likely. Um, Same goes for probably a a Brent Burns. You're not signing PK Subban. I mean, let's be honest. There are two defensemen in the league, in my opinion, that you could replace Chris Letang with, and they're both not on the market and currently playing either in the Stanley Cup final or in the conference final. Yeah. Actually three because I had them. Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean, like the, the, the three different, yeah. <laughs> Makar, Adam Fox, and Victor Hedman, who are all obviously playing right now still, uh, probably the three best defensemen on the planet, um, right. in my opinion. And, yeah, I mean, it's looking like Jaquin. Based off those, the writing from LeBron, it sounds like the, the talks are – definitely a little more closer with Latang, and I think they're prioritizing him a bit, him a bit more. And, you know, I, that's fine with me just because, you know, you don't really have a plan B or even a plan C if he does walk. You know, you, you would – it would behoove them uh, to sign him and just get, get that out of the way here. Um, that is the main update for both Evgeny Malkin and Chris Latang. Um, coming up in the next segment, we're going to get into our dream um, – Broadcast teams for AT&T Sports Network, um, and I'm going to read the quote that um, some Pens fans had in the article in The Athletic for why they ranked the Penguins broadcast where they did. But before we get to that, 
Um, don't you love a chewy chocolatey brownie? What about a caramel brownie with caramel swirled on top? It's so good. And what if I told you that you can have all that chewy chocolate deliciousness plus 17 grams of protein? Well, you're in luck because caramel brownie bars are available at built.com right now. And you got to act fast because they're a fan favorite. These are better than dessert. Plus the macros are unreal. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only four grams of sugar. I would replace a regular brownie with built caramel brownie bars in a heartbeat. The best part, they're covered in 100% real chocolate and for real, they, they definitely are. For With built, you don't have to sacrifice tasty for healthy. You can have both. There are a million reasons why you should try built bars, but for now, let's just say that caramel brownie will rock your world, and that's not an understatement. You can go to built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, I'm back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. You want to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at L O underscore Penguins. And I'm pretty sure um, Penguins noted killer Frank Vitrano just get, got into a fight with is that Brandon Hagel or something like that? Uh, that was a weird. It is Brandon Hagel. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that was a very two weird players to get into a fight. Um, that's for sure. Um, but, but let's get into this uh, fun little segment here, Doug. So. It, it was. I'm going to find the tweet here. I think it was from our good friend um, Jason J underscore A155, who I um, talked to all the time. I'm going to get him on the show here at some point. He's he's declined it a couple times, but I am determined for all of you to get that beautiful person um, on to the show. So, um, so the the Athletic ran the article this morning of uh, NHL fans around the league ranking their best broadcast, the local broadcast, to the worst. And the Penguins, um, out of all the teams in the league, they came in at 27th. Um, obviously, Steve Mears does play-by-play. Bob Airy does the color. Uh, the local rating from the Penguins fans gave it a 22, so below average. The national rating from the people, 30th. <laughs> Last season was 26. So, you know, you, only, you can only go up from here, or you could potentially go down, of course, a little bit. And um, one Pens fan apparently said, Bob Airy gets a bit amped up at certain points and speaks more so as a fan than a commentator. Passion is certainly welcome, but it has been, has to be based on solid analysis. Being excited while keeping a level head and correctly analyzing the play is the difference between a broadcaster and a fan who lets their favoritism cloud their judgment when speaking on what happens on the ice. Um, I think that's probably the perfect way to sum up what Bob Airy is on the broadcast. I mean, you know, I've lost track of how many times he says Detroit, or Bruins or something like that, or, you know, just the, the areaisms or, you know, oh, Mirzi, oh, my God, it had pucks in the net or whatever. It's just, I mean, yeah. I probably have two or three Bob Airy, you know, tweets per game for all of you that listen to the show that follow me on Twitter just because of how hilarious he is. Um, Doug, I'll, I'll start here with you. What would be your, your dream um, broadcast in Pittsburgh that you think would be arguably the best broadcast Um in the league for local uh, for locally at least i mean i think that you know this might be an un unpopular opinion upon some people but i think steve mirrors does an amazing job and i think he's really really good at what he does interesting um, something you guys something you guys may not actually know about me is um i went to broadcasting school so like i've broadcasted games before i've done all that and i think the biggest thing that Steve Mears runs into is that he's doing broadcasts with a guy that's almost double his age. And, you know, like I'll say, Bob Barry doesn't really provide a whole heck of a lot of analysis in terms of like actual hockey, or at least, you know, translates the game that's relevant to the year of 2022. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if, I honestly, I think the biggest solution is just given, given, given him corn straw. Um, you know, there were a couple games this year where uh, Josh Getzov and Phil Bork were both out in COVID protocol and Colby had to step in alongside Paul Staggerwald and do some games. And I thought that he did amazing on the radio side doing Keller um, that if you, if they start making that transition eventually where Colby starts doing some games with Mirzi. That's going to be a big that that'll be a big step in the right direction because it's two guys that are similar in age. Um, they're both kind of young, and they're both very intelligent hockey minds, you know. And I mean, I think the biggest thing 
the, the biggest thing that makes a successful broadcast is uh, having good chemistry. So, you know, I think that if you would get Steve Mears and Colby Armstrong to develop some good chemistry together, I think that there is a um, there's potential for it to be a really, really good local broadcast that gets recognized nationally. That one will be interesting. You know, in my opinion on Mears, I think he's fine. I mean, obviously it's big shoes to fill because, you know, you're broadcasting to a very, very passionate fan base. And it looks like Nikita Kucherov just made up two to nothing. So it looks like for right now the Bolts are going to send it back. But I'm not trying to get old takes exposed again. I'm not going to guarantee it like I did last night. Um, anyways, um, I think Mears, again, a little vanilla. I think he could be better with some of his goal calls. Um, he kind of just says the same thing for each one. Um, kind of want more catchphrases from him. You know, he, I feel like he needs to let the game breathe a little bit more. Um, this has only been, he's only been doing this for a few years, so I'm sure he's in it for the long haul. And I know it's potentially hard for him, um, to maybe, I guess, go fully into it because, you know, this is his, this is the team he grew up cheering for. So, you know, you gotta set aside, you know, being a fan of the team and, and, and broadcasting, for that team and you know being objective and you know usually he is that but i still want to see more from him as he continues to develop um into a broadcaster he's not the main issue for me you know it's it's been you know area just because you know he's he's definitely definitely a homer um i i, I will say that i don't think it's you know jack edwards level that level bad over here you know a couple of the panthers guys down in sunrise who are definitely um not the greatest i think the islanders broadcast used to be really bad um you know, Craig Laughlin, Craig Laughlin, excuse me, in DC, never really been a fan of him as a uh, commentator, but my, my dream one, Doug, for play by play, bring in John Forsland. I, I will go to bat right now. He is the best play by play announcer in the NHL with Doc Emmerich and Mike Lang retired. I mean, a hundred percent, you know, in terms of experience, the way he lets the game breathe, um, you know, his goal calls, you know, the feel for the game that he has um, the knowledge of the game that he has, um, that's a slam dunk for me. I, I you know I, I could I would offer that guy a lifetime contract, um, to say the least. On a national level coming in, I would probably have Ray Ferraro as my guy between the benches. But you know, I would also I mean I might go off the um, the end here. I would love to bring in Brian Engblom. You know he would he would have been he would oh when he did the work for um I believe it was NHL on NBC with um, Dave Schrader. Um, re- obviously, rest in peace. He's not here anymore. Um, you know, he was a great play-by-play announcer too. They, they was a, they had a great B team. Um, I loved Engblom's analysis. I think he will be uh, tremendous with a John Forsen. I think Engblom is down in Tampa, if I'm not mistaken. He does their, um, I believe he he does their uh, color commentary for the broadcast down there. Um, that would be my dream. Um, uh, broadcasting duo for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think that would instantly be a top 10 broadcast in the league, probably even a top five. Um, in my opinion, you know, just the, the knowledge that both of them have for the game, um, and the way they talk about it, but like, plus again, you know, let the game breathe and all that. Um, it would be second to none. That, that, that is my dream one right there. A little, a little off the wall with the uh, color commentator, maybe not so much with the play by play, but. It's it's one that I think would be an absolute killer for the Penguins. Yeah, and there's one there's one more person I want to name drop real quick. If I could bring another person in, um, Joe Beninati to do play by play. The old the guy who used to do a lot of the playoff games on Versus whenever uh, Sid and Gino for league, like for whatever reason his raspy voice brought, brought a lot more energy to the brass. And like there's so many really good goal calls. Like he had that goal call for the uh, Malkin spinorama for the hat trick in the um, 09 conference final against Carolina. And it's just, it's amazing. Like it is, it's just, I, I really liked him. And I think that, you know, he would be another great asset to like make a broadcast better if you had the ability to do so. Joe Beninati would be great. You know, I, I do remember those calls from the 09 cup run. It's a shame that Washington scooped him up. He does a great job. I'm up in DC and you know, I will always, you know, even, even though I don't like Craig Laughlin as their color commentator, I, I do like listening to Beninati with his goal calls and he's very knowledgeable about the league as a whole. And, you know, he definitely loves doing it um, for Washington. I also will say this on a national scale, some may not know him too much. He does a lot of work in Canada, Chris Cuthbert uh, of Sportsnet. I would bring him in in a heartbeat. 
Um, he has done a lot of Penguins games over the years. I um, believe he does a lot of the Maple Leafs games now. Doug, I know you you, you obviously um, do follow the Leafs a lot more than most Penguins fans. So um, he he his calls are great. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy him calling games. Um, he would be very high up on my list as well for color commentary. You said it, Colby Armstrong. He would be up there as well. Um, no, that, that that was that's a fun little exercise to think about because you know I, I know the Penguins can do better with this duo, and, and you know I, I know people that have told me that, that they will actually you know sync up the radio broadcast with Getzoff and Bork to the TV and mute the TV so that they can listen to the game and also watch the game that way because that broadcast is so much better. And, and I agree with them. I think Getzoff, you know, it is very hard to fill in for Mike Lang. I mean, he is probably. No, he's not probably. He is one of the best play-by-play hockey announcers in the history of the sport. Him, Doc Emmerich, Rick Chernet. I think, honestly, those are my top three, With along with Bob Cole. I think those four right there are in a different stratosphere compared to anyone else around the league. Um, and Phil Bork, he's a good color commentator. Um, I always enjoy his work on the radio network. He did great with Mike Lang. And um, that, that's a duo that's, I think, only going to continue to be really good over the next several years. I agree, you know, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. Josh gets off kills it. Like, he does really, really good with the broadcast. And, I mean, Phil Bork's been great for probably the entire time that you and I have been following the team. And I think I, – I, I agree. I'm really excited to see what the progression looks like over the next couple of years with those two, if they're able to stay together. Yeah, I agree. I, I really hope that no other team comes poaching gets off because – I mean, I brought him on the show. He's one of the nicest people you could ever talk to. And, um, you know, the way he was talking about the team, it it was like he had been there for almost as long as Mike Lang uh, was for the team. So that was a fun little exercise. Talk about that based on the article that we saw today. Coming up in the final segment, we're going to get into um, some some more silly season stuff with free agency uh, looming pretty soon. It's about a month away at this point. The final is going to be starting in about a week to a week and a half. So we're going to get into some of that right after this commercial break. All right, we're back here in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. You want to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at LO underscore Penguins. So, Doug, you know, I I know you. You know, I'm sure you've been on Cap Friendly um, quite a bit throughout the offseason. Um you know, there, there's quite a bit of free, good free agents at basically every position. Ha, who has caught? Okay, let's, we'll play a little game here. Say the Penguins do bring back Latang and Malkin, and say they bring back Evan Rodriguez, which would also be a very good call. Uh, maybe they also bring back Dan Heinen. You know, who knows what they do with the rest? When you look at that roster, you know, who and with the potential trades that they could make, who on the free agent market? intrigues you the most because sure they're not going to go out and probably give a lot of money to a player but you know who's a player that you know they may they can maybe go bargain hunting like the carolina hurricanes do um with stuff like that well i think with how successful last year's last year's uh show me deal for danton heinen was i kind of want to see them pursue andre kasha if he doesn't resign in toronto i think that he could be a really good top nine scoring winger option and probably be a Kapanen replacement if he does end up departing um, via free agency if they non-tender him or if they end up moving him out. Um, because believe it or not, man, I really think that they could get something of value for Kasperi Kapanen on the trade market, especially if, especially like if they're able to get him at a cheaper cap rate. Um, I mean, there's there's no way he should be making near three point two million dollars next year. Um, and, you know, if he's making between one and two million, he's a good third or fourth line depth piece. I mean, obviously, the defensive zone impacts have gotten much better and that would ma- allow him to pass off as like a fourth liner Evan Rodriguez type where he can still shoot the puck and score, but also play sound defensively down in your fourth line, especially for a contender. Yeah, K- Kasha would be an interesting case. You know, my, my, my biggest thing with him, though, man, is obviously his health. Um, he's been banged up a lot throughout, throughout mm-hmm. his career. Obviously has a lot of talent. I mean, he's displayed that everywhere he's been. But, you know, can he stay healthy is the big thing. Because, you know, Kampanen, you know, just a year ago, 10 goals, 40 points. You know, do you think Kasha could have something 
similar to that, or do you think it will be more of what we saw this year of McCappen, who was someone, who was better defensively, but the puck was just not going in the net? I think we could see something similar to like I, I wouldn't say comparing Kapan and sidelines, but I'd be looking for something like a Danton Heinen where he comes out and scores like 15 ish goals and everybody's surprised by it. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, would the price be right? I mean, I think that if that's a guy, that's a guy you could bring in for around a million, million bucks at this point and bet on him and hope that it works out, you know? And I mean, knowing this team and their cap situation, those are the type of guys you have to go looking for. Um, you have to find those diamonds in the rough. I mean, similar to what the Toronto Maple Leafs do in free agency as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, your, your job as a general manager when you have a team in contention, usually with your core locked up, obviously it's a bit different this year, um, you should have an easier job than most of the other general managers. You build around the fringes. You know, you, you sign depth forwards to complement your stars. You bring in defensemen who are mobile and can support your number one guy. You bring in a backup that can support your, your starting goaltender. And, you know, speaking of that last point, Doug, the Penguins will have an open spot there. Tristan Jari is obviously going to come back, but Louis Domingue is a UFA. I don't think he's going to come back, and nor should he. Um, K- Casey DeSmith is also a UFA this year. And, you know, I think he'll potentially be wanted on the open market by teams who could use a backup goaltender. You know, he was a much different goaltender um, after, you know, January or early February of the season when he really started to turn it around. Um, you know, I know there's not a lot of strong options at that position, but do you think the Penguins should move on from the Smith and Good Bargain hunting there, or do you think they should bring him back again and run it back? Well, run, run it back. I spotched that up. Whatever. I think that I think that you should at least keep your options open when it comes to keeping Casey DeSmith around, because like, it's it's so hard to find reliable goaltending. Um, but at the same time, I would welcome a change there. Um, maybe a more of a veteran guy. I'm not really sure who, but like, give me somebody more proven and give me somebody that can realistically run with Tristan Jari as a one A one B type of tandem for an entire season, rather than. To Smith just coming on at the end of the year um, when he was horrible for most of it, you know, because winning those little fringe games in November, December would have been nice, um, especially with where the Penguins were at in terms of uh, playoff seating and home ice advantage. It really came back to bite them in in the butt that uh, Casey DeSmith was so inconsistent throughout the season whenever he did get games. Yeah. Yeah, I, I and I don't think enough people are talking enough about that. Um, though you, you're, you're right. I mean, DeSmith was really bad that first half of the season. Jari started too many games, and you know, I I've, I floated this idea once. I think on the show during the off season, uh, it would be hilarious to see all those Yinzers who, who go to who who go to the games or who have season tickets, uh, and did the Braden Holtby chance to see him potentially sign with the Penguins and be the backup. Um, not what he once was, obviously, but he was still pretty serviceable. I thought. In Dallas this year when he was healthy, he's going to be a UFA. Um, he, he would put, probably be one of my top options overall. I think he would make sense there. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, trades I think is also going to be a big part of this offseason for the team. And, I, and I'm not saying they're going to make, you know, three to four to five trades here. You know, maybe it's one or two. Hextall is not really known for, you know, swinging for the fences here. Um, but Doug, you know, if, to keep to keep a lot of these guys here, they're going to have to clear out some cap room. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a salary cap league. Um, if it were up to you, and I know everyone has different answers, but I wanted to get your input. You know, who, who would you have on the block? I think Brock McGinn is probably going to be on the block, just simply because they have guys in Drew O'Connor and Redeem Zahorna that can do his job at. A cheaper rate, um, you know, they could save about two million bucks there. Almost three by having, <laughs> yeah, almost three by having um, O'Connor, Zahorna, league men, or maybe just a little bit more than league men. And um, you know, this might be a hot take coming from me, but like, put Mike Matheson on the block, man. Wow, like, see if you can that, cash that, out that a little big. bit. Because, like, I mean, I know that he's good at moving the puck up the ice, but at the same time, like. He did blow like he he did pretty much blow a playoff game or two for them in that Ranger series by tipping pucks in off his skate blade, 
or office stick or whatever it may be. Too many times you, know, you've I caught mean, it like the wrong place. Right, exactly. You know, and the last thing you need in a, from a defenseman in the playoffs is him getting caught with his pants down, you know? And I mean, for Mike Matheson, that happened like four or five times in the, in the, in the Rangers series, you know? And um, I mean, you know, like, obviously, like I would put Doom on out there too, just to see if you could get something um, out of him. I think his perceived value around the league is very much higher than what it actually is at this point in the game. And, you know, I mean, see if you can find a take around Jason Zucker. I mean, I know that that guy was a baller and he really put it all out on the line in the playoffs for them. But, uh, you know, I mean, almost 6 million is almost 6 million, man. Like that's, that's a lot of money for them to be messing around with if they're able to clear that out, you know? And I mean, Kapanen should be as good as going as well, in my opinion. Yeah. Hey, Friedman was talking about that Kapanen situation. He says it's going to be one of the RFAs to keep an eye on to see if he gets a qualifying offer. He'll probably get one, but I don't probably think he should come back unless he's really willing to take a league minimum kind of deal. You know, the problem with the Penguins, you know, they've they've been able to create cap room in a few of these last um, off seasons. Remember, you know, they they dump Matt Hunwick and Connor Sherry to Buffalo, and you know, those are good moves. You clear up what four to five million in cap space. You suddenly have cap room to go out get a decent player in free agency. And then Jim Rutherford decided to barf all over himself with signing, you know, the human corpse that is Jack Johnson. And I don't really care that he's in the Stanley Cup final right now. They're not there because of him, but you know, maybe they are in some kind of uh, evil way. And then last off season, Doug, you know, they, they probably make a mistake trading Brock again, uh, well, not Brock again, Jesus. They make a mistake, mistake trading Jared McCann, excuse me, um, but then Seattle does them the favor and they take away Brandon Tatum's contract. And it's like, okay, you've cleared out some good cap space here. You know, I'm fine if you wanted to get rid of Tatum's contract, but you have to use that space wisely. You went out and signed Brock again to a four-year, $2.75 million deal. I was higher on it than most. Um, I will take the L on that, at least for the first year. Played well in spurts. After he got hurt, was not the same player. Took a really boneheaded penalty in game seven. He decided to try to play hero and not dump the puck in, and, well, you know, he paid for it. He's lucky he didn't get called for a penalty shot there um, on Keandre Miller. Um, made a couple other moves with Evan Rodriguez and Danton Heinen. That's fine, but you still had room to go out and get a backup goaltender, but you decided to run it back with DeSmith, who ended up getting hurt in February anyway with a torn groin, which, you know, obviously took took him out for good um, in the playoffs. So that's my biggest concern, man. If you clear the cap space, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be smart with it? Are you going to learn your lessons from last year and a couple of years before that when the other regime was here? You know, that's what I think I'm scared of the most. Well, that's, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the scariest thing is like, there's nothing more dangerous um, in the league than a general manager with cap space. Um, Because lots of ridiculous off the wall stuff happens. And, you know, I mean, it's not every day that you have money to spend and you wake up that the morning of July 1st, you look at your wife and you say, I'm going to sign Jack Johnson to a five-year contract where he makes $3.25 million. I mean, uh, I'm still not over it, dude. And I, don't think I, 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 hope, I hope someone just screenshots this on the YouTube page. That, that That's me every time I think about it. It's just, yeah. Uh, it, it, it kills me, man. But you know, there's we still there's still a lot of time until free agency starts. We still got the Stanley Cup final. Um, you know, congratulations to the Colorado Avalanche for getting to the final first time in 20 years. Um, Tampa Bay right now is up two nothing heading into the third period. They're trying to tie up that series against the Rangers. A Tampa Bay Colorado final would um, be excuse my language hockey porn um, right there, to say the least. Um, but I think that'll do it for this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. Um, Doug, if you have anything to plug in with uh, the show coming up, um, I'll give you the chance to do that right now. Honestly, man, I think right now we're just waiting things out. Probably going to start recording a lot more during or closer to the draft because that's when we're going to get more movement, get more free agent rumors. Hopefully Malkin and Latang are locked up by then. And then, you know, we'll just, we'll go from there. You know, we'll see how it goes, but 
you know, as always, just be sure to subscribe to Four Checking TV on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts from. And, you know, we'll go from there. Yeah, Thank you for having remember, me on that. Uh, Doug does post something, you know, be sure to check it out. You can follow him on Twitter um, as well. Doug, plug that right now. Follow um, follow me, my me, my personal Twitter at Doug underscore Gladke and follow the show's Twitter at Four Checking TV. There you go. Yeah, you can go check out all of his prior episodes and, you know, Read Doug's very good tweets um, on his timeline um, because, you know, his, his tweets are actually good takes. I know mine are obviously um, hashtag very bad, as the kids like to say. But that will do it for this episode. Thank you all so much for listening. I'll be back with another one on Wednesday as we continue to be five days a week throughout the month of June. I do think that is going to change in July, at least after free agency happens um, and the draft. Once that occurs, um, the show will go back to three days a week. So at least another month of being um, every day for this podcast. So again, thank you all so much for listening and I'll talk to you all on Wednesday.